Software design documentation can be hard. Some organizations create ridiculous amounts of it. And some organizations only want to know one thing. Why isn't your software done yet? Well, one thing is for sure. If you develop a thorough and complete set of software design documents, you'll end up with a bunch of engineers who have worked there for 30 years who never actually read the documents. And if you skimp on your documentation, you'll end up with a set of engineers straight out of college who want to quit on day one because they can't imagine why a class inside of a monolith would have 5,000 lines of code. Why does that class have 5,000 lines of code? In this video, we are finding solutions for software design documentation, and we're going to make a bold prediction about the future of software design documentation. So stay tuned. <laughs> When you're building up your software design, it is helpful to have a diagram to work against. It can be a flow diagram to understand the logic, or an ER diagram so that you can better understand your data, or an object-oriented class diagram so that you can detail out the classes of your object-oriented design. Diagrams like these can help a team of developers all pull in the same direction. We all know that change happens, right? So when a critical new use case is discovered, or we realize an architecture assumption that we made is off, how do we update our design documentation? Do we throw it away and start from scratch? Do we have a model-based approach where the model is shared amongst a number of people and backed up regularly? Another approach that's really starting to catch on is called diagrams as code. This has the big advantage of fitting right into your DevOps or DevSecOps pipeline. The code lives in GitHub or Bitbucket. Therefore, the diagrams literally live alongside your code base. I mean, they are a code base. So my big prediction in this video is that diagrams as code is the approach that most companies are going to start using from now on. And the reason for that is not just because of the way that saving your diagrams in Git facilitates better configuration management. No, the reason why diagrams as code is going to take over everything is because it enables communication with a very low cost and very, very experienced set of software architects. Come to think of it, experienced is probably the wrong word. I think a better word might be trained. That's right, I'm talking about Google Bard and ChatGPT. So in this video, we're going to create a basic design, we're going to create a diagram for it, and then we're gonna have a conversation about that diagram with those two large language models to see how helpful they can be. Let's do just a quick overview of mermaid.js. Mermaid.js was initially launched in 2014 by Newt Svidequist. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Thank you for the free software. The vision behind mermaid.js was to simplify the process of generating diagrams and flowcharts for software documentation. It quickly gained traction because of its practicality and ease of use. Mermaid.js is free and open source. It uses the MIT license. It enables you to generate flowcharts, sequence diagrams, Gantt charts, and even other diagram types. Mermaid works with markdown text, which is used all the time in software documentation. Whenever you see a file in a GitHub repository called readme.md, that's MD stands for markdown text. So this allows Mermaid to live alongside the software that it describes. This makes it really easy to keep in sync with the software as the software design progresses. And that's a really a key advantage of mermaid.js. So let's dive into learning a little bit about Mermaid and the syntax that it uses to create diagrams from code. To do this, let's create an example. Let's say we're writing a software system that has a real world sensor that calculates temperature and that we connect that real world sensor to a REST interface. We connect it to a backend database and we connect it to a graphical user display. One sensor with three connections to a display, a database, and a REST API. We're going to write the code for inside the system that takes that data and moves it to the other portions of the software. UML class diagrams are great for representing object-oriented design, so we'll start there. In this example, I'm using VS Code to build up the diagram in real time. On the left side of my VS Code window is markdown text, where I'm going to enter in the mermaid syntax to create the diagram, which is previewed on the right side of my VS Code display. To drop mermaid code into markdown text, you use the 
back tick symbol three times, you type mermaid. It's sort of like a multi-line comment. You say back tick, back tick, back tick, mermaid. And then when you end it, you have the three back ticks again. That's how to insert a mermaid diagram into markdown text, which is a nice way to build up the diagram. Even if you want to save a file specific for your mermaid text, this way you can watch it get built in real time as you're typing the code. We know we want to create a UML class diagram. So the first line we say is class diagram diagram, camel case. Don't uppercase that C or you'll have an error. We're representing a temperature sensor in an object-oriented design. So let's create a class and let's call it temperature sensor. Here we go, class temperature sensor. Now, this class is going to interface to data stores, graphical displays, REST APIs, and it needs to have the ability to get the latest data. So we're going to have attributes of data store, for that uh, database. Well, let's just say graphical display for the GUI and web rest API for the interface to the web. And we're going to add a method uh, using this notation to say read temperature. And there's actually a couple different ways to write this. I, I could show you multiple ways of writing these classes. The squiggly brace way of writing it is kind of nice because it kind of puts it all together and it makes it easier to see. So we've defined this class called temperature sensor and we've said it needs to interface with a so far unelaborated database, graphically used interface and REST API. So let's create some classes for those three things. We'll create a class, lowercase c, don't forget, for the data store, and we'll give it a method to update the temperature. We'll create a class for a graphic display and uh, we'll create a method to update the temperature. And lastly, we'll create a class for just to represent that REST API and we will add a method to update the temperature, not surprisingly. And now let's just show some basic relationships between these things. We In this system as it stands today, it's gonna be a one-to-one -one relationship. There's a lot of useful interfaces that you can add to your class diagram when you're writing mermaid code. So in this one, we're just gonna have it be a basic relationship, uh, one to one. Uh, as you can see here, to create that basic relationship, you just use two dashes and you say one to one. You could put an asterisk, uh, but in this case, we just wanna have them all be one to one relationships. We've created a basic class diagram representing our system that we're gonna be creating with an object-oriented design. Now, did we do a perfect job? Is this great? Did anybody notice that I named this diagram anti-pattern? Well, now that we have our diagram, let's have a conversation with a couple of large language models and see if they can critique our design to give us some ideas on how we might do this better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe the system that we have in mind to Google Bard and ask it to critically review the system. I am designing an object-oriented system that takes temperature data from an external sensor. It sends it to a REST API, a database, and a GUI. I have a class diagram of my initial design. Could you review my diagram and give me critical suggestions if you see any improvements? Remember, it's always a good idea to tell your language model to be critical because oftentimes they're, they're biased to agree and be positive. So you need to let it to know, I'm looking for problems here. Uh, and lastly, I say thanks because, hey, why not be nice to the large language models? Also, uh, let's go ahead and paste in the code text of our diagram. All right, here goes. Let's see what Google Bard, experimental version, has to say. Sure, I can review your class diagram and give you some critical suggestions. Overall, your class diagram is well-structured and easy to understand. Do you see what I mean about how it has a bias towards positivity? You could add a class called temperature data to represent the temperature, the data that is read from the sensor. You could have the class add attributes from the temperature value, the timestamp, and any other relevant information. The temperature sensor could then have an operation to get temperature data. You could also add a class called temperature service to represent the logic for sending temperature data to a REST API. Finally, you could add a class called temperature controller. So essentially, what Google Bard has recommended is to make the data a unique class, temperature data instead of temperature sensor, and give it more attributes, which makes sense. It's probably just a, something that's incomplete in the design at this point. It's, it's, uh, that is a good catch, right? So the next step in completing this class diagram would be 
to add timestamps to the data, right? It makes total sense, especially since something's called historical data in our diagram. And then creating something called temperature service to represent the logic for sending temperature data to the REST API. Now that's a good idea too. After all, how can you hook up to a REST API? What if the internet's down? You know, you, you wanna have some interface in between the REST API and the temperature sensor. So this is a completely reasonable recommendation. This is a much better design. It says, finally, you could add something called temperature controller for the overall logic for the system. Uh, this class could have operations for starting and stopping the sensor, as well as for checking the status of the sensor and the data transmission. The temperature controller class could be used to control the entire system from a single point. So it's really done a pretty good job of sort of dynamically updating the recommendations for the class for creating an improved diagram. You know what? I'm a big fan of this approach of reading it and learning and thinking. This is very important, but this is a YouTube video. Let's ask it just to rewrite the diagram for us. Could you generate the mermaid code based on the recommendations made above? Sure, here is the mermaid code based on the recommendations made above. <laughs> Use code with caution. So we'll grab that. We'll come into here. All right, so we'll create a new file. We'll say Google Bard Improve Class Diagram. We'll put the three ticks and we'll type mermaid and then the three ticks. And then we will paste in the code that Google Bard created. Now, here is the Google Bard Improved Class Diagram with like a rough sketch we talked with Google Bard and it created an improved version that had several reasonable improvements. That's kind of amazing. Let's try the same thing with ChatGPT. All right, so we're gonna use GPT-4 and we're gonna use the exact same query we did with Google Bard. Here it goes. Boy, it's thinking very hard. Your initial design is a good start. These language models are so nice. However, it can benefit from a few advancements to further align it with object-oriented principles and design patterns. So the first thing it does is it tells me that I need to use the observer object-oriented design pattern. Interestingly enough, without even prompting, it gives me a class diagram. Oh, it's thinking hard, it kind of glitched here. Oh, class, good. Remember to do the lowercase c, good job. It may glitch out. A lot of people are using ChatGPT right now. Whoa, it just blasted out a bunch. All right, here goes. Oh, this is weird. Ne oh, I got network error, actually. Gosh darn it. It says network error, but if you look at it, it looks like it actually completed the diagram. I don't know, I might have to do a take two with a new chat, but let's let's put this code in and let's take a look and see how it looks in uh, in Mermaid. So we've got some, uh, uh, after some tense moments, we got some code back from ChatGPT. So let's go ahead and create a new file. Three backticks, mermaid, the three backticks again, and then we will paste in the diagram. So for some reason, it looks like ChatGPT thinks you can write the word interface on, under a, a class diagram, but you really can't. I think you have to make this a class. So just a little correction there. You can see here, this is the this is the documentation for mermaid.js. Let's go uh, interface. There, now it's an interface. So interestingly enough, ChatGPT had a little bit of a glitch when it was talking to us, and for some reason it mistakenly thought that there was a interface keyword in uh, mermaid. I don't know why it would have thought that, but regardless, with that fixed up, here is the chat GPT improved version of the diagram. So the Google Bard version and the chat GPT version. The, the chat GPT version really focused on a narrow look at what the diagram was trying to do and it gave the observer pattern to the diagram. Whereas Google Bard thought more about the end goal of things like the REST API and it kind of went more in the direction of, of inserting a controller. And, uh, you know, both of these are improvements. There's absolutely no doubt that both of these are improvements. Uh, it looks like GPT 
really, really took a pattern-based approach in solving just one thing, whereas Google Bard tried to solve a lot of things. How hard can it be to find an experienced software architect that has learned these lessons throughout their career? And the ability to just throw a really rough sketch of a design down and then ask a large language model, like, you know, using all of human history, what do you think about this design I came up with? And to have it make these kind of recommendations is, well, you can see why my prediction is that diagrams as code, code to diagrams is going to be the dominant way of doing this in the future. It's, it's going to win. And I'm using the phrase dominant in a game theory sense. Companies that don't adapt to this are going to be in trouble. So one obvious consideration here is you can't put sensitive, proprietary, or secret information into a public-facing large language model. These large language models take those inputs and use them to retrain themselves. You need to take your conversations and make them abstract enough that you're not giving away your proprietary information to whichever large language model you're using. Don't lose your intellectual property by just posting it online. Hey, quick note, I'm not a lawyer, Nothing I say ever constitutes legal advice. Seriously, that's not a joke. I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. Don't fall into the trap that Samsung did when one of their employees put proprietary information into a large language model. I believe it was source code. Now, that said, if you don't have a policy in place where you specifically tell your employees how they can or cannot use a large language model, they probably already are, particularly developers people who do the cutting edge work, they're probably already touching a large language model. So hurry up and generate a policy if you haven't. So how do we get around this? You get around this by creating a policy that educates your employees on how to use large language models without handing over proprietary information, or you go to the trouble of possibly rolling your own large language model, try to get secure access to a large language model so that the inputs that you provide aren't being turned into training data. That might cost a little bit more, but one thing's for sure. In the meantime, you need to create a policy where your employees are empowered to know exactly what they can and can't do with a large language model on the company's behalf. Don't lose your intellectual property rights. Today, we asked Google Bard and we asked ChatGPT to join us in designing a piece of software. And boy, were they up to the challenge. ChatGPT reminded us about design patterns and helped us move our software into the right direction. Where Google Bard helped beef up the data that we were using and reminded us that when we interface to a REST API, we need to do so through a service, and it created a temperature controller class. Both of them gave us improvements from our existing rough draft. Both of them cost a minimal amount. In fact, one of them is completely free. Based on this success, I think it's very likely to say that if you can get a intelligent AI to double check your designs, why wouldn't you? I mean, I think it's a no brainer that this is the approach that's going to work. Companies that follow this approach are going to be more successful than companies that are closed off to this approach. Every one of your software architects can now pair up with a model that's been trained on a lifetime of knowledge. And that's on top of the built-in advantage that mermaid.js has with aligning with your DevSecOps pipeline. I'm pretty confident in saying that I'm looking at my crystal ball and it says that mermaid.js is what everyone's going to be using in the future. It may or may not be mermaid.js that ends up winning, but some kind of a code to diagram approach is going to take over in the future. What do you think? Are you worried about uh, robots coming for your software architect job or are you one to welcome our robot overlords and work with them in cooperation? Let me know in the comments below. Wow, thank you for making it to the end of this video. I really appreciate you. Could you do me a big favor? This channel could use some help. Would you mind liking and subscribing to this video? And here's what I'd really like you to do. If this has inspired some thought and reminds you of a conversation that you had with a colleague, would you do me a favor and click the share button and send this video to that colleague so that you can keep the conversation going with them. Thanks so much for watching and have a data-tastic day. <sighs> We're workshopping slogans. I don't know. Never ask GPT for a slogan.